This is John Kamins of Foster Swift, Collins & Smith. I want to welcome everyone to our webinar, 10 Things to Know Before Your Municipality Borrows Money. This is going to be a one-hour webinar. I'm going to spend about the first 45 minutes uh, speaking to you, and you can follow along on your screens um, on the slides that we will advance through. Uh, I'm literally covering 10 things to know. Uh, so there are 10 numbered things going forward, although we left the numbers off so that you could read it better. Um, and I'm going to throw a few extra things in at the end. Um, first, I want to uh, tell you uh, a little bit about uh, myself and about Foster Swift. Uh, Foster Swift is a nationally recognized Michigan bond counsel firm. I have been a bond lawyer for more than 35 years. Uh, Foster Swift and I are bond counsel for the state of Michigan the Michigan Finance Authority, the Michigan Strategic Fund, and many diverse uh, Michigan townships, cities, counties, drainage districts, school districts, um, downtown development authorities, economic development corporations, um, everything in the whole gamut of uh, municipal borrowers through bonds. Um, personally, I have been uh, a chairman of the section of the state bar for municipal lawyers, the public corporation law section, and in the National Association of Bond Lawyers, I was a drafter of its model bond opinion project in 1984 and have been very involved as a panelist in its annual educational conference. And I was on the steering committee for that conference 2008 to 2010. Uh, I also want to mention that I've been a nationally uh, engaged expert witness in municipal bond securities fraud cases. And um, I have a lot of experience not only in issuing bonds, but in the uh, securities disclosure aspects of them. Um, and uh, something I invented for the city of Detroit won a national award in 2005. It was an unprecedented kind of securities that was a nearly one and a half billion dollar funding of their unfunded pension liability. And there's a national newspaper in the bond industry called The Bond Buyer, which has national awards. And uh, our deal that I invented in Detroit was the winner of the 2005 Midwest Regional Deal of the Year. Um, I want to tell you what I'm going to cover, but first I want to begin with a story that was told to me by a Chicago bond lawyer. Um, he told me that uh, two people were up in a balloon on a balloon ride, but they got completely lost and they didn't know how to find themselves. Then they were over a farm and somebody said, there's a man standing in the field, let's lower ourselves and ask him where we are. So they got down to shouting distance and they yelled to the man, can you tell us where you, we are? And he answered, yes. You're up in a balloon about 20 feet off the ground. And uh, one of the people in the balloon said to the other, he must be a lawyer. And the guy asked why, and he said, because he gave us an answer that was perfectly accurate, but totally useless. Uh, today, uh, although lawyer chokes abound, and that uh, fits many lawyers, I'm going to cover in this time um, 10 things you need to know before your municipality borrows money. And I will aim to be totally accurate and totally useful. Uh, some of you may know about issuing bonds and borrowing uh, for a municipality. Some of you may not. Uh, I hope this will be clear and useful to everyone. If you have any questions, you can certainly um, come back to me. If you have questions during this, um, this uh, presentation, you can use the question section of your control panel to type in your questions. I'm going to devote the last 10 or 15 minutes of our hour to answering questions. Um, also, we ask you to please complete the survey that will display on your screen at the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you. What I'm going to cover basically is uh, highlighting things that uh, you need to, uh, or you ought to uh, know so that as you get into financing, uh, you'll have your bearings and you'll understand uh, what's coming and uh, what people are talking about. Uh, this disclaimer is uh, just simply to tell you that um, I'm not acting in a lawyer-client relationship with you here and giving you legal advice you're entitled to rely on, but I hope you will find it helpful, and I certainly invite you all to contact me anytime in the future, today and onwards, uh, anytime you have a question you'd like to bounce off me regarding uh, uh, municipal finance uh, or, um, or anything related. Thank you. Um, first thing we're going to do is ask what are the reasons to borrow money? Uh, first of all, fundamentally, uh, municipalities borrow money by either issuing bonds or notes that are a form of debt that have principal to be repaid at uh, stated dates in the future and interest to be repaid at stated interest rates uh, on that outstanding unpaid principal. 
Um, they borrow money to finance capital expenditures for public projects. This can be the whole gamut of uh, public um, property, such as uh, water and sewer systems, uh, streets, uh, streetscapes, public buildings, city halls, um, fire halls, um, and um, uh, equipment, uh, computers, furniture, anything that is part of uh, capital expenditures uh, for a public purpose uh, by a municipality. Um, they also may issue bonds not for that which I call new money to spend, but also to refinance outstanding bonds. If they have bonds outstanding, for example, at what was a high interest rate and now interest rates are substantially lower, just as you refinance a home mortgage to take advantage of lower interest rates, so you may refinance outstanding bonds. Refinancing bonds is called refunding them, and I will talk more about refunding at the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, a third purpose for borrowing money is to uh, fund accrued pension liabilities or um, OPEB liabilities. OPEB is other post-employment benefits, primarily retirees' health care. Uh, many municipalities have very significant uh, actuarially determined unfunded accrued liabilities for pension or OPEB, and there's been a new Michigan statute uh, uh, that allows uh, bonding for that under some special circumstances. Um, and you also borrow when you do a bond issue to pay the costs of the bond issue. Those are costs of, for example, the underwriter or discount that finds buyer or placement agent that finds buyers for the bonds, um, the bond council, uh, other lawyers in the transaction. Um, uh, there's printing and publishing costs incurred. Those are part of the cost of issuance. And if there's a rating uh, from a rating agency, which I'll talk about later, uh, the rating agencies have a fee that is also payable as a cost of issuance. Um, the next slide talks about um, the professional advisors that um, you will need from the start if you're even thinking about doing a bond issue. Uh, the first one is Bond Council. It's a firm such as Foster Swift that is uh, nationally recognized and expert in, uh, in uh, bond law. Um, nationally recognized means that uh, the firm's legal opinion has been accepted for taxes and bond issues, and um, no one but a firm that um, is nationally recognized in that way uh, can be your bond council. Uh, Michigan uh, includes a number of firms, and uh, I'm happy to say Foster Swift is one of them. Um, there also should be a financial advisor. That's another firm. Um, the Dodd-Frank Act uh, that reformed national uh, banking and securities law um, a couple years ago uh, for the first time required these municipal financial advisors to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, and uh, they will be subject to certain um, federal laws, rules, and regulations, but many of those rules haven't been finalized yet. Uh, under the Dodd-Frank Act, we call them a financial advisor or an FA, but the Dodd-Frank uh, Act calls them a municipal advisor. Also, you have to find someone to buy the bonds, and to find a buyer for the bonds, there will be either an underwriter or a placement agent utilized. That's another firm, uh, and I will talk more about that later. And lastly, if you're doing, for example, a sewer or water project, uh, you will probably have engineers involved uh, before anything else, uh, designing the specs so that you can go out for contractor bids, figuring out what the costs will be, and very often your engineering firm will be telling you that you ought to be doing a bond issue, and uh, that's when you'll want to start talking to bond counsel or a financial advisor. I'll also mention, although these are the professionals you need at the start, when you do a bond issue, one other important player is called the paying agent or transfer agent or a bond registrar. Uh, sometimes it's also called a trustee. Whatever it's called, it usually has all those various functions, and um, there are just about uh, uh, very few firms in Michigan that have corporate trust departments or businesses who could be that role. Uh, one of them is Bank of New York Mellon Trust Company, one of them is uh, U.S. Bank, and one of them is Huntington Bank. Um, and I will uh, move on because I'm just trying to give you sort of the overview here without uh, digging real down, for example, on what are the functions of a paying agent and transfer agent. Um, before there can be bonds or notes issued, and let me distinguish bonds and notes, uh, when there's borrowing, if it's longer than a year, it's called a bond. If it's going to mature and be payable at maturity, 
In less than a year, it's typically called a note. Uh, it's the same thing, however, and I'm just going to talk about bonds from now on. Uh, when issuing bonds, you have to find some state law, some state statute or statutes that specifically authorizes your kind of municipality to issue that kind of bond for that kind of purpose. And so um, there is a necessity to do that. For example, there is not a law in Michigan that allows any municipality to just walk into the local bank and do a bank loan. Uh, that's not legal. It's not within the powers. But there are plenty of uh, laws that uh, specifically allow the various kind of municipalities I mentioned earlier to issue bonds for public improvements, public buildings, water and sewer, uh, a variety of other things. Uh, uh, there's probably a statute for almost anything, but uh, your bond counsel or your financial advisor needs to basically identify which bond laws will enable you to issue bonds for what you want to undertake. Um, just know the term enabling legislation. Those statutes are sometimes called enabling legislation, and if none exists, you can't do it. Uh, so I would make a point to you that when I said earlier that there's recent legislation passed and enacted and in, in law in Michigan for issuing bonds to finance uh, unfunded pension liability or unfunded OPEB liability, uh, that is enabling legislation which did not exist a couple years ago, but now it does. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the sources of payment and security for bonds. No one's going to buy the bonds unless they know where's the money going to come from to repay principal and interest when due, so there's never a default, and also to know what are the, what kind of security uh, collateralizes the bonds. Uh, what if there is a default? Uh, what backs it up to make it uh, less risky and more credit worthy? Well, first we have to talk about the various kinds of bonds because they have different sources of payment and security. Uh, one category of bonds is commonly called general obligation bonds. And people in the industry often just call them for short GO bonds. Um, and general obligation bonds are of two types. Uh, one is UTGO, unlimited tax general obligation. And um, that is one where basically if they're issuable and they are unlimited tax general obligation bonds, um, they are payable from the general funds of the municipal issuer of the bonds. But additionally, it pledges that if necessary, it will levy property taxes uh, without limit um, to whatever extent is necessary to collect tax revenues to be able to pay principal and interest when due. Um, unlimited tax general obligation bonds require a ballot proposal at an election and voter approval. In other words, the uh, electors in the municipality uh, must approve uh, the unlimited tax general obligation or there's no legal authority for it. Because very often uh, you don't want to go with a ballot proposal or you know the voters likely wouldn't approve it, um, you often don't even go that route of trying to do UTGO bonds and you may do limited tax general obligation bonds. Those are also a general obligation payable from general funds, but instead of being backed by an unlimited tax uh, pledge, uh, they're backed by what is called a limited tax pledge, meaning that um, the township or other municipality that has taxing power will levy taxes on property if necessary in its borders, uh, but subject to constitutional, statutory, and any charter tax rate limitations that may exist. Uh, so for example, if um, those uh, tax limitations have already been uh, uh, utilized and uh, there's no room to levy taxes anymore because you're up to the full limits, uh, you can't do limited tax general obligation. But if you haven't uh, used the full capacity of the limits, uh, you could do LTGO uh, up to that limit. And that um, uh, sometimes is uh, an attractive uh, feature uh, to attract bond investors. Um, the LTGO is sometimes uh, called uh, a first budget obligation. I don't want to spend time talking about what that means, but uh, um, you should be appropriating in your annual municipal budget uh, for paying uh, UTGO and LTGO bonds. And another term you may have heard, full faith and credit, a pledge of the full faith and credit, uh, that uh, is almost synonymous with uh, a general obligation bond, uh, but again, it could be either unlimited tax or limited tax, full faith and credit pledge. Um, distinguished from GO bonds, revenue bonds, 
those are bonds that are not a general obligation payable from general funds, but they are explicitly payable only from specified revenues that are um, uh, the source of payment and security for the bonds. Uh, for example, if you have a water system and you have rates and charges for water users, um, that bond may be payable from the uh, revenues of the water system only, and there will be a statutory lien placed on those revenues of that system, and those bonds will be payable from those revenues and not be a general obligation. However, you may also sometimes do revenue bonds and put on top of it a limited tax general obligation pledge. Also, you may have heard of special assessment bonds. If a municipality properly um, establishes a special assessment uh, district and a special assessment role and levies special assessments on property owners that are specifically benefited uh, by particular improvements, for example, uh, sewer or water or streets or curbs, um, those special assessments can be a source of payment and security for bonds to finance those kinds of improvements. Something else is called tax increment revenue bonds. Um, there's a way of um, freezing the uh, assessed value uh, by simply a determination when bonds are issued and then looking at how the um, uh, assessed valuation will increase because of the financed improvements and then to capture that incremental increase in taxes, those are kept, called captured tax increments and those can be a specified pledge of source of payment for uh, tax increment revenue bonds. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention that uh, years ago it was very common to go get bond insurance from companies that uh, provided insurance for a paid premium up front and um, typically that got your bonds the highest rating, the AAA rating, which attracted buyers and um, bond insurance was often very um, much used. Uh, with the financial crash around 2008, um, Unfortunately, the bond insurers all crashed also. Currently, there are basically two bond insurers in the marketplace. There's talk about another one coming on. Um, they aren't quite like the old days, and uh, your financial advisor might recommend uh, bond insurance uh, in a particular instance, but it's not, um, it's not something nearly prevalent uh, the way it used to be. Also, there used to be sometimes a bank letter of credit that would be issued that could be drawn on as a source of payment and security for the bonds and people were attracted to the high credit worthiness and rating of the bank. Uh, but now uh, banks have been affected by the financial fiscal crisis and crash and so they generally uh, are not available or to a very limited degree uh, to issue bank letters of credit to back up bonds and if so uh, that could be expensive and not uh, cost justified. Uh, what are tax exempt bonds? Um, uh, you all probably know this, but fundamentally the interest that the bondholders receive on tax exempt bonds is exempt from federal income taxation. That's a way to state it generally. Specifically, that's not exactly accurate, but the point is people are attracted to bonds that are exempt from uh, federal income taxes uh, because they typically do not have to pay income tax on their interest income on the bonds. Alternatively, if the municipality was borrowing in a conventional loan that was legally possible, uh, the conventional lender is in the business of lending and it would charge interest and receive interest, but it would have to treat that interest as ordinary income and pay itself federal income taxes on that interest. Therefore, it would require a higher interest rate because it's interested in its after-tax yield on that interest income. So therefore, Tax exempt interest is always better for uh, a bond issuer like a municipality because it will have a lower interest rate than taxable. And um, if you're going to do tax exempt bonds uh, under federal tax law, uh, they have to pass a lot of hurdles by the date you issue the bonds. And then there's a requirement uh, for post issuance compliance all the time that the bonds are outstanding. That gets complicated and is beyond the scope of uh, today's session. Uh, under state law, anything you issue in Michigan as a bond or note, probably by the enabling legislation, will be exempt from taxation, including income taxation, in the state of Michigan. So uh, they're probably always tax exempt under state law, but uh, not tax exempt under federal law unless, um, unless your bond council makes sure that that's possible and that they are. Um, and I also want to caution you that uh, I told you it's advantageous to do tax exempt because generally the bond owners don't have to put that uh, income 
interest income into their uh, federal income tax returns. However, um, you all hear in talks uh, nationally uh, of the Congress planning to do federal tax reform of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, who knows if they ever could agree on anything or when that will happen, but one of the proposals that's out there is to cap uh, the benefit of the tax exemption at a 28% income tax rate. So that, for example, if a bondholder were getting tax exempt bonds interest, uh, but it was paying a tax rate on federal income tax of under 28%, it would get the full benefit. However, if its tax rate was 38% or 39%, uh, effectively it would have to pay income tax on the tax exempt interest, uh, or rather the interest um, on the bonds uh, uh, over or above that 28% rate. Um, that's not the law. It may never be the law. But if it becomes the law, it will impact the, uh, the, uh, the economics of doing taxes and bonds. They'll still be better uh, than, uh, than taxable bonds, uh, but maybe not quite so much better. So we'll stay tuned on what happens on that. Today, however, uh, it's a complete uh, uh, exemption uh, from, from um, federal income tax, uh, although, as I say, there's, there's some exceptions to that uh, particular statement. It's good as a general statement. Okay, how, how do you find a buyer for your bonds? How are bonds sold? Uh, there's basically three ways. One is called the competitive sale. This is done by many municipalities. They have published a certain kind of notice of sale uh, in that newspaper, the bond buyer, and posted electronically in certain places. And then on a stated date, um, bids to buy the bonds will be received and opened. They'll either be um, written bonds sealed that are opened uh, at the time and place stated in the notice, or they'll be sent, submitted electronically, which many people do now, and the uh, bond that is most economically beneficial, the bid that is most economically beneficial to the municipal issuer will be the winning bidder and will be awarded the sale. Uh, how you decide which is economically most uh, beneficial, the bidders will be quoting different interest rates that they would accept on the bond or a different price that they would pay for the bond, or different redemption provisions possibly uh, for the bonds. And based on factoring those things into uh, uh, a computer program, primarily the, the purchase price and the interest rates, um, the uh, calculation can be made, which is uh, basically the cheapest borrowing all in for the municipality. That'll be the winning bidder. Uh, alternative to that uh, competitive sale with published uh, notice and uh, bids, uh, there's something called a negotiated sale where the underwriter, uh, the uh, municipality says, we're going to go with a particular underwriting firm and um, they're going to structure the bond issue and they're going to market the bond issue and uh, then uh, they'll do a public offering to find buyers for the bond issue and uh, they'll get to the point where they will sign a firm bond purchase agreement uh, committing to buy the bonds at a future date, maybe 10 days hence, maybe two weeks hence, um, and all the terms will be uh, baked in uh, final form in that bond purchase agreement, um, and it's the underwriter that uh, uh, buys the bonds at those negotiated agreed interest rates and, uh, and uh, other such terms. Um, Another alternative is a private placement. Uh, instead of an underwriter, there might be a firm that is a, a placement agent firm, and it'll find buyers such as uh, institutional investors um, who will agree to buy the bonds directly. The placement agent, unlike the underwriter, won't buy the bonds directly. Uh, they will identify buyers, and uh, they'll sign a bond placement agreement for closing 10 or 14 days hence, and at that closing, their identified buyers will actually buy the bonds directly from the issuer. Uh, when I mentioned that the underwriter will buy the bonds in a negotiated one, that's not because the underwriter or underwriters, there may be more than one, wants to hold them as an investment of its own. They intend to resell them to ultimate buyers. Uh, for a competitive sale, um, the um, um, notice of sale is a disclosure document. It tells important terms about the bonds. For a negotiated sale, uh, there's a prospectus, it's a printed written document, uh, and for bonds it's typically not called a prospectus, it's called an official statement, and it's first done before all the terms are determined in order to attract uh, buyers, 
and that is called the preliminary official statement, and it's indicated that uh, some things that are in it are subject to change, they're preliminary, and some things are still blanks because interest rates, for example, haven't yet been determined. Um, by the time the underwriter has determined the final rates and they're agreed to, then there is printed a final official statement. Uh, if it's a private placement instead of a prospectus, there is an offering memorandum, which is typically first a preliminary offering memorandum subject to change, and ultimately when the terms are final and set in stone, a final offering memorandum. Um, securities laws are extremely important, uh, uh, applicable to the disclosure. Um, if you were doing a stock offering for a corporation, uh, typically you'd have to register the stock with uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission under federal securities laws. Currently, the nice thing about municipal bonds is there's generally an exemption from registering that way with the SEC. Uh, although, though, there's an exemption from registration for municipal bonds, um, still the federal securities laws anti-fraud rules apply, and if there is in the offering of the bonds uh, fraudulent um, advertising, so to speak, in the disclosure documents, uh, there can be civil and criminal liabilities. You don't want that to happen, so you need uh, very great advice on uh, complying with the federal anti-fraud laws. The one I want to mention here just is you may have heard of Rule 10b-5. It's the principal statement of uh, defining fraud. If uh, there's use of interstate commerce, uh, which there always is if you're using the Internet or email or telephones, so you're almost invariably in the marketing of bonds, uh, even in a private placement, uh, utilizing interstate commerce, uh, then you don't want to violate Rule 10b-5. You will violate it unless you have in your offering documents no misstatement of a material fact and no omission to state a fact necessary to be stated to make the statements made in light of the circumstances under which they were made not misleading. So you can see how important the disclosure is uh, for avoiding fraud. Um, there also are state securities laws in every state, and in a public offering, the bonds might be offered in all 50 states, uh, or some of them, um, and uh, also in a private placement, certain other states may be uh, involved. States have their own securities laws. Those are often commonly called blue sky laws, and uh, I won't go into more about that here, but uh, I want you to know what blue sky laws means. Okay, um, after you issue your bonds and they're outstanding uh, and you've used an official statement or a private placement memorandum or maybe you've had a competitive sale, uh, with certain exceptions, most bonds have to be subject to uh, SEC Rule 15C212. That is a rule that says um, there needs to be filings of continuing disclosure about the bonds as long as they're outstanding after they've been issued. Uh, and these filings need to be made with a national online electronic uh, uh, place. It's called EMMA, E-M-M-A. That stands for the Electronic Municipal Market Access. It's operated by the MSRB. That is the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. In any event, if you wanted to see EMMA, you could just Google EMMA and uh, you will find it. And um, all official statements after a certain date uh, for, for bonds that are subject to Rule 15C212 can be found on EMMA and also the uh, filings that are made, uh, uh, that are required to be made after issuance, which are both annual filings of certain financial and operating information about the issuer and also event filings. There are a variety of enumerated events that are called specified events and if they occur, uh, there's a need to file within 10 business days after their occurrence with EMMA, uh, a certain notice of the occurrence of those things. There are things most prominently, for example, default on paying principal or interest when due, but also a variety of other things. I want you to know that um, the obligation of the municipality to do this continuing disclosure will be contained in an agreement that the issuer will sign at the bond closing um, with the underwriter and it's called a Continuing Disclosure Undertaking, or a CDU. Sometimes it's alternatively called a Continuing Disclosure um, Agreement. But in any event, uh, that's where the obligation is incurred. And if the municipality breaches it, the good news is 
That's not a default under the bond issue. The bonds are not defaulted. However, it is a default under disclosure, and it basically means that if you ever want to do a bond issue in the future, um, having breached your continued disclosure obligation, um, your name is mud in the, in the marketplace for bonds. So you want to comply with all your obligations, and if you accidentally fail to comply, you want to cure the breach as soon as you can. And when you're doing your next bond issue, if you have defaulted, uh, it may be a problem. Okay, now, I want you to know that in Michigan, there's something called qualifying status, and um, you can't issue bonds unless you have qualified status from the Michigan Department of Treasury, and um, that is a special uh, thing that your financial advisor or your bond counsel can tell you more about. Fundamentally, you must have filed your annual budget with the state, uh, uh, your annual audited budget of a municipality, uh, and you need to file a form called a qualifying statement with the local audit and finance division of the Michigan Department of Treasury. Um, in order to do that, uh, you'll access the Treasury's online uh, uh, portion for a qualifying statement. Uh, you will need to have a logon ID that is specific to your municipality. Uh, for those of you who have already done this and have had qualified status, you may not know that beginning May 1, 2013, just uh, very recently this month, uh, your login is not good anymore and you need to get a new one. Um, and um, um, the way that you file your qualifying statement is not the old way. It used to be that uh, you filled in a form online and submitted it. Now there's uh, a form online that you can fill in, but you'll have to turn it into a PDF and then submit that uh, PDF uh, to Local Audit and Finance Division. Um, if you get qualified status by meeting all the requirements, uh, it's not discretionary with Treasury. If, if you meet the criteria, you will get a letter called the qualifying, Qualified Status Letter and um, it means that you can then issue bonds in Michigan uh, uh, for a period of time after that because you've got that qualified status. Annually, though, you need to, uh, to renew your qualified status. Uh, also, at the Treasury online um, uh, database, uh, you can find out uh, for any municipal um, issuer just by indicating its county and then uh, uh, the municipality in, in particular, you can find out if it has qualified status or if it is applied for it and um, the date of it. Okay, I want now to uh, tell you that uh, this thing was billed as 10 things you want to know or ought to know. Uh, we're now up to the 10th slide or the 10th thing. This is now a catch-all. I'll cover a few things here uh, before we get to our, uh, our timing for uh, questions. So uh, for about the next 10 minutes, I'll talk about these other things. The first one is, uh, I mentioned bond ratings earlier. Uh, there are three national bond rating agencies for municipal bonds. Alphabetically, their names are Fitch, um, F-I-T-C-H, uh, Moody's, and Standard & Poor's, which is sometimes called S&P. Um, and um, you may choose to get a rating from one of them, or two of them, any one of them, or any two of them, or all three of them. Uh, they all charge you to uh, give you a rating, and there's no assurance in advance of what the rating will be, so you definitely don't want to apply for a rating until that has been recommended to you by your underwriter or financial advisor, your FA, um, and then uh, you will go through a process of application, and uh, they may uh, ask a lot of questions. You may supply them later information. There may be meetings and conferences with them. Ultimately, they will give you a rating. Um, if you have the rating and it's, uh, it's a good rating, first of all, um, if it's uh, not at least triple B, which is called investment grade, uh, uh, that's very bad. Nobody wants to basically buy bonds that aren't investment grade. Uh, sometimes they will be buyable, but with, with an extra high interest rate to compensate investors for that risk that is perceived because they're, they're, they're not highly rated. Uh, but the ratings above that can be triple uh, A, double A, single A, or gradations of those things, such as uh, A plus or A minus. Um, and um, uh, enough said, I think, about the ratings. The rating agencies do charge for uh, the, uh, the ratings, uh, but if you're marketing bonds and you can say what the rating is, very often that helps attract buyers' interest in the bonds. Many, many care more about uh, what the rating from S&P is 
than to uh, do their own homework on the bonds. Um, now, some bonds are sold without a rating, and um, that's possible. Um, uh, it just means that um, marketing bonds and finding buyers might be a little more difficult than if they were rated, because so many of the buyers uh, are interested in rated bonds. Um, that's uh, some of what I'm throwing in this catch-all. The bottom thing on this slide is I talked to you about federally tax-exempt bonds before and how you have to meet particular requirements for particular kinds of bonds for them to be federally tax-exempt. Sometimes you just can't meet those requirements, but you still want to borrow. So you still could do a bond issue generally the way I said, but it might be called federally taxable. Uh, the interest rate would be higher than if it was tax-exempt, but still, that is a possibility. And sometimes it'll even be the case that for a particular project, whatever it is, you can do tax-exempt bonds, but only up to a certain amount. And the rest of it, you might do a tax-exempt, a taxable series for. In this catch-all, I didn't list any more things, but I'll mention a few more, because we have a little bit more time before 1045 when I'll start taking questions. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is um, earlier I talked to you about um, um, refunding bonds, when you want to refinance. I want to tell you in that regard uh, uh, the main reason for refinancing, as I already said, is uh, cost savings by replacing the higher interest rate that was uh, locked in on the old bonds when they were issued with a lower interest rate that might be available in the prevailing marketplace currently. Uh, and obviously, just like refinancing a home mortgage, you can reduce your debt service payments if you uh, pay less interest uh, over time. Uh, so um, uh, that's the primary reason, uh, cost savings. Um, um, when you do a, a, a refunding for that reason, um, interest rates change in the marketplace every day. They can go up, they can go down. I think you all know that. So uh, you only undertake this when you expect that uh, in the time you can get your team together and get your bond issue uh, documented and done, uh, that uh, by the time you, you want to lock in the interest rate, uh, interest rates will still be favorable. Uh, at that time, they'll be determined. And if they are favorable, you'll do your deal. And if they're not, you'll just defer doing your deal. You won't do it because the interest savings don't make it cost justified. Um, if you uh, are paying off the old bonds, there's a necessity to look at their terms. Um, some bonds for their first 10 years, more or less, may be not subject to being pre prepaid early at all at the option of the issuer. Uh, so um, uh, if the bonds are prepayable because they've been outstanding for more than 10 years or beyond the no-call period, uh, then they typically are um, prepayable um, maybe on any uh, first of a month or any interest payment date or practically at any time. So you have to look at what is the callable date, and that's the date on which you'll take them out. You might close your refunding bond issue before that date and put your bond proceeds in an escrow held by an escrow holder uh, and then use them on the uh, redemption date for the old bonds to pay off the old bonds. Um, sometimes, however, you might find it worthwhile to do what is called an advance refunding rather than a current refunding. A current refunding is if you can pay off and get rid of your old bonds within 90 days after you issue your refunding bonds. If you are going to be taking longer than 90 days in order to have a call of the old bonds for redemption prior to maturity and getting rid of them by paying them off, uh, then you're doing something called an advance refunding. That's possible. Your bond counsel and your financial advisor or underwriter can tell you how to do that. Uh, but in that event, in all likelihood, your escrow will be outstanding for a longer period of time, and your bond proceeds will be invested in something that is a special form of federal uh, investment that the U.S. Treasury issues called uh, SLUGS, S-L-G-S, State and Local Government Series of uh, Federal Treasury Obligations. Uh, they're kind of like treasury bonds or treasury notes from the U.S. Treasury, but they're, they're called SLGS, slugs. And uh, they will give you whatever interest rate and not higher than the interest rate on those slugs until they finally uh, mature uh, that your bond council says is okay. Uh, if it's too high, um, your bonds can't be federally tax exempt. So uh, that is extremely important, and it's all I really have time to say about that. 
Also, if you're doing an escrow, there's one more player. There will be a firm hired who is called verification agent. And um, bond buyers will want to know if they're buying refunding bonds that the old bonds will definitely be taken out uh, and that there won't be an obligation of the issuer to pay the refunding bonds, but also the old bonds that were supposed to have been refinanced or refunded. So the, re the verification agent will do a report that basically attests to the mathematical calculations that the sufficiency of the principal amount and interest income to be earned on the slugs or on the, on the monies in the escrow will be adequate to completely pay off the old bonds through their redemption date, taking into account uh, those dates and uh, the principal amounts and the interest amounts and interest rates due on those old bonds. So I've told you about an escrow and slugs and a verification agent in, in connection with a refunding, uh, most often with an advanced refunding, but also you have those things sometimes with a current refunding. Next thing I want to mention to you, because um, it's worth your knowing, is um, uh, that um, um, sometimes when you issue bonds, um, you want to pay bond proceeds on expenditures for your project that you already use some of your other money for before you could do a bond issue. In order for that to be doable, it's very important uh, that you ask your bond counsel to help you adopt very early something called a reimbursement resolution. A reimbursement resolution is to comply with requirements of the federal tax laws. And basically, it says, we are a municipality. We have an intention to uh, do some kind of municipal project uh, that is referred to. Uh, we intend to issue bonds for it when we can, tax-exempt bonds even. Uh, but meanwhile, we want to spend some of our other available funds uh, on cost of the project before the bond proceeds become available to us. Uh, but we intend to use those bond proceeds, once we have them, to reimburse ourselves for those earlier expenditures that we have made uh, on the project. Um, and uh, if that is a, a proper form of uh, duly adopted reimbursement resolution, uh, it will allow those bond proceeds to later be received and reimburse the issuer, uh, the municipality, for those earlier expenses. However, um, the timing of the uh, reimbursement resolution is very important because uh, expenditures that were incurred after it uh, uh, are fine to be reimbursed, but expenditures incurred before it are generally not fine to be reimbursed, except for expenditures that were incurred within the 60-day period before the adoption of the reimbursement resolution. So there's little flexibility there. Also, certain uh, soft costs like uh, uh, engineering costs or uh, or if you took soil uh, borings to see if you could even build where you want to. Uh, some of those costs are called preliminary costs and could have been incurred even earlier and, and still be reimbursed. Uh, this is all technical federal tax stuff, though. So just know and remember you want to adopt a reimbursement resolution uh, in all likelihood, and the sooner the better. Um, I also uh, will take this opportunity to tell you about one other thing, and that is um, sometimes you may have heard that municipal bonds can't be issued without publishing a notice of intent and that there might be the necessity of a referendum by the uh, municipality's voters, electors, uh, on whether to issue the bonds. Not all bonds are, are, re are requiring that, but many kinds of bonds uh, do require uh, publishing in a newspaper uh, um, notice of intent to issue the bonds, basically saying that bonds will be issued uh, not to exceed some stated principal amount for some stated purpose sufficient to identify to the voters uh, uh, what kind of bond issue you're undertaking. It may not even be um, a general obligation bond. Um, this is not like the Bell proposal to authorize UTGO bonds. This is just, for example, to issue revenue bonds. And, um, and some statutes say you can't issue those particular revenue bonds without publishing that notice. That notice will also tell people that if they are registered voters in the municipality, they have the right to sign a petition requiring a referendum on the issuance of the bonds and to duly file it as stated in the notice by a certain date. Um, and typically, they have 45 days after publication in which to file that notice. There may be a different number of days, though, in a particular instance. Um, Normally, you want to publish that notice early enough because normally no petition is filed, and when the 45 days are, have lapsed, 
you know you're in the clear and you can go do your bond issue. So you normally want to factor publishing that notice of uh, intent early. Uh, if petitions are filed, typically it requires 10% um, of the electors to have signed the uh, petitions, and it's, you know, they must be duly signed and submitted by the, the requisite date. If so, there needs to be a referendum uh, at an election date um, that's a normal election date, um, and um, uh, you can't issue the bonds until um, the referendum uh, fails. If the referendum passes, and that's, there has to be a referendum, uh, or rather, rather there will be a referendum, I beg your pardon, uh, it's the outcome of the, uh, the vote, yes or no, can you issue the bonds. Um, I'm going to stop there. I'm sure there may be questions, and uh, if there are questions uh, um, either that have been sent in or that anybody wants to ask, uh, I think I'm right, you can ask them uh, now or only by, by sending them electronically. Please tell me, Kyle. Only electronically? Okay, you can only type them in. Um, right now, we have we have no um, questions. I would certainly invite questions, uh, um, and um, um, I would I would uh, say we'll wait a few minutes in case uh, we find that you have any questions. I could, of course, take this as a sign that I have been so impeccably clear. Uh, I didn't uh, raise a single question in your mind, but um, I would expect you may have follow-up questions. I'll also say to you, you have my uh, phone number and my email, and I would really welcome you to uh, ask me a question anytime you may want. Um, I may not be your lawyer in a lawyer-client relationship, but I'll be happy to talk to you and maybe point you in the right direction. And uh, of course, ultimately, you may need to engage Bond Council, um, and there are other firms as well as Foster Swift, but uh, we'd love to be considered by you. Okay, I'm finding that uh, no one has sent in a question, and accordingly, I guess uh, um, I'll, uh, I'll merely say to you, we'll terminate the uh, webinar here and now, and uh, we'll invite any of you who have questions to call or email me. I thank you very much for listening, and I hope you find this helpful. I hope you also realize how critically important the state laws are, uh, the federal tax laws are, the federal securities laws are, so you definitely want to have... Uh, uh, veteran uh, professionals on your team uh, in the form of bond counsel and, uh, and uh, uh, financial advisor or an underwriter uh, so that you make no missteps. Uh, I wish you all uh, great luck with your financings and uh, I'm always here for you. Thank you. The organizer